Good morning. If you don't know me, I'm Gregory Cameron, and I look after ecumenical affairs at the Anglican Communion Office. This morning, I've got an old friend with me who's in a very significant position. She's the President for Europe of the World Council of Churches, and it's Dame Mary Tanner. Mary, could you tell me, how did you come to be in this post? Well, Gregory, it all happened back in 1973. That was the beginning of the story, when I received an invitation to go to a meeting in Accra, Ghana, of the Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches. You know that the Faith and Order Commission is, of course, the theological arm. That proved a life-changing experience for me. First of all, it was my first time out of Europe. Secondly, I met um, Christians from many different traditions, some that I'd never heard of before. There were black liberation theologians, feminist theologians, some very important names like Jorgen Maltman, for example, a young, uh, a young Desmond Tutu, Letty Russell. I came face to face with black liberation theologians, feminist theologians. And the first week we, we had to discuss um, giving an account of hope in context of brokenness. And I was in a, a context of discussing the community of women and men in the church. Not what I'd expected um, from a Faith and Order Commission meeting. And then the second week, we worked on a very early draft of a text that became the Lima text, Baptism, Eucharist and Ministry. Probably, I think you'd agree with me, the most important ecumenical text of the century. Well, as I packed my case, reeling from the experiences that I'd, I'd had in Ghana, one of the vice moderators came to me and sensing how, how excited and, and stimulated I'd been by the meeting, he said to me, Mary, stick with it. Well, I did stick with it. I caught the ecumenical vision. And I, of course, later became the president, of the, the moderator of the Faith and Order Commission. And then um, in 2003, when I went to the assembly of the World Council of Churches, thinking this really is my last large ecumenical gathering, I was amazed to return home as the president for Europe. So that's my story, quite a long one and a fascinating one. Absolutely fascinating. Now, at that assembly, the assembly wrote an ecclesiological statement. I think they do that at every assembly, don't they? And this uh, uh, statement was called, called to be the one church. Now, it's a quite a complicated statement. It's full of theology. Why should the bishops here be bothered with it? Well, let me try and try and answer that question. Why should the bishops be bothered about it? As you've said, each assembly uh, gives us a statement, a short statement, on where the churches in the Fellowship of the World Council of Churches are in understanding the visible unity of the church and challenges to take steps towards that goal. Now, it's important because it's a statement that comes from the widest ecumenical forum that exists. And it's a sort of litmus test, I suppose, for where the ecumenical movement is. So that's one reason why should we should be bothered about it. The bishops, when they gathered at the 1998 uh, Lambeth Conference, had before them the statement from Canberra, the Canberra statement, um, the church's koinonia, gift and calling, and they passed resolutions about that statement, um, asking for study of it, asking for the World Council to go on working at statements on visible unity, and particularly asking for a relationship between unity and mission in the statement. So the bishops at Lambeth, certainly Lambeth 98, took it uh, very, very seriously. And then, of course, since 1998, the Canberra Statement has been used in our theological conversations, our ecumenical conversations with partner churches. It's also been embedded, as you know, in agreements with the Lutherans, the Reformed, the Moravians, the Methodists, and it's served as an overarching context in our discussions with the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Churches. So I think that's why the bishops should be bothered by, with this statement at this conference. Thank you very much. But if I might push you a little bit further, I mean, some of the bishops might be saying, well, 
this ecumenism thing's all very well, but I'm really interested in evangelism. I want to get on with the mission of the church. What practical difference does a statement like call to be the one church make? Well, I think, first of all, if the bishops can respond to it here and, and respond positively to it, and then back at home discuss it with their ecumenical partners locally, I think if, if they can agree that, yes, this is very near what we think about the visible unity of the church, then that is a, gives us a very confident basis for sharing in service and mission locally. So it's an impetus, if you like, to shared mission. Thank you. Uh, well, they're in an Indaba now, these bishops, and they've got 90 minutes ahead of them. They're going to look at the Anglican Roman Catholic statement as well, growing together in unity and mission. As they're together for the next, next 90 minutes, uh, what do you think they ought to be discussing and thinking about today? I think the two questions, um, two questions certainly in relation to this text and the text that you've discussed, growing, to, growing together in unity and mission, I think I'd want the, the bishops to ask, first of all, can we recognise in this World Council of Churches statement what we believe about the visible unity of the church? And in particular, I'd want them to look at that one paragraph that we've actually highlighted in the, in the handout on, on the, the call to be the one church. And I think I would want them to ask, um, is this uh, where I as an Anglican am in understanding the visible unity of the church? And I think it's very interesting how very close that paragraph is to the uh, Lambeth Quadrilateral. So it's, ve it's very um, compatible, I think, and I would, I'd like the bishops to see that and to discuss that. But the second question, I think, is the question of mission. Um, I always remember Archbishop Desmond Tutu coming to a faith and order assembly and saying to us, apartheid was too strong for divided churches. We needed to be together in facing up to apartheid. So I think the question for the bishops is, when you look at your local context, what are the issues that are too strong for divided churches? And how can you together face the issues in your particular context? That's a very strong question indeed, and I hope the bishops will come up with some answers for us. Thanks very much, Mary. It's been good to talk to you today.